Actually, I was thinking maybe I should change the topic to be, you know, stop, now that we're late, how can we expand this quickly to get to the bar? Um, but let's, uh, let's, let's go ahead. And I'll save a little bit of time for, for questions at the end. Oh, this is me, uh, today anyway, I guess. Um, I think the one thing that's unique about my background as an investor is the fact that I've invested in five continents. And I've sat on a whole bunch of boards, which doesn't necessarily make uh, for anything special, except for a lot of uh, experience with a lot of different companies that have been in different industries, different geographies, and working... Um, you know, in many different places. So I put a couple of example investments, and I'll actually talk about a couple of these today. Credit Tech is a fairly well-known company in Germany at this point, growing fairly quickly. Um, I was one of the first investors there. Society One is a, is a fast-growing lending company in Australia. Uh, Credorax is based in Malta. So I'm just giving you a little bit of, uh, of a, a flavor the, for the fact that I've at least been involved in multiple different markets around the world. So the favorite topic today in Silicon Valley, so I'll start there because this is, you know, kind of, if we talk about Silicon Valley as being where, where all the magic happens, well, okay, what is it about Silicon Valley? It's unicorns. So I uh, assume everybody here has probably heard of, you know, the, all of the blog posts and everything about unicorns, um, but just to make sure... One of my friends, Aileen Lee, came up with the term unicorn a couple years ago, meaning a company that's worth a billion dollars in valuation. And it was a big deal because, according to Mark Andreessen, there's only 14 created every year around the world. Now, all of a sudden, we've had this explosion, and there's more than 14 per year. And so, does that mean that, you know, that we're in a big bubble? Does it not? I don't know. But what I'm talking about today is, is less about whether or not valuations are extreme, but if you're going to try to create a unicorn, you're going to go into a bunch of different markets. So here's what the headlines don't say. This is approximately your odds of creating a billion dollar company. Um, and there's a few different numbers out there, but this is one that I took from approximately the number of startups per year uh, that get at least angel funded. Uh, so this is starting from having some money that you've raised, your chances are uh, pretty, pretty small uh, of being that big. So that's not meant to, to make anybody feel like this isn't going to, you don't have a shot, there's, there's no chance. This is just to say when people talk about billion dollar startups and you read TechCrunch and it sounds like every day somebody raised $500 million at a $10 billion valuation, it's not true. Um, so what does world domination take if you're going to try to go into new markets? One billion dollars. Uh, no, it does take a lot of capital. It takes a lot of know-how, it takes a lot of capital. It is not something that is, you know, simply done. Let's, let's uh, be very clear about that. Um, so this is one of the things that it takes. It takes real, real dedication. Um, and I think every entrepreneur is very dedicated. I think there are some that are ex exceptional in terms of what they will do and go to the, to the mat for. There's been a couple that were on stage today that gave some amazing stories about you know, being down to thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 and deciding to, to keep going and not give up. And, and there's, there's many stories like that, but, but it does take some real kind of special dedication. And it's not just from the founder, it's from the entire founding team and from the supporting cast, from the investors, from everybody involved. So this is, it's not a kind of, oh, I'm just going to go big and I'm going to do this. It takes some real, real extra effort um, and, you know, the ability to put in that time and, and uh, bring people. I mentioned this in my talk earlier. Sorry. Um, do you have the right team? Do you have the team that can actually do this? If you don't have the resources, it's not just about capital, it's about the people. At the end of the day, great people build great companies. So do you really have the team that's got the capacity to do that? Because one of the things you have to assess as you're looking at your growth pattern for your company is, does my team have what it takes to do this? 
Because there's multiple different ways to grow a company. There's not sort of one just path that, that everybody should follow that, that says, oh, you know, you're going to go big, you have to follow the Uber path. That's not really true. It, it, depending on markets, depending on what you want to do, lots of different ways you can do this. Do you have enough capital? I think this is something that gets discussed a lot, but it's actually really, really critical as you think about how you're going to evolve your company. And obviously, I'm, I'm part of the capital side of the equation today. I spend a lot of my time doing this, and I invest typically early stage. So at the, here it probably would be a Series A type round, a million dollars to two million dollars, or a million euros, two million euros approximately. Used to be that I couldn't do that math, but now I can. It's getting easier. Um, but it, do you have enough? So you have to really think about what are your resources as you're looking at your growth pattern and what markets are you going to go after. So if you have enough m money to go after your local market and you don't have enough to go into the next one, you shouldn't overstretch yourself. You shouldn't go beyond your means. And you should also work with your investors to, to figure out what is it that's the right path for you and not just sort of um, you know, take your, your growth path that you think you need to follow. You should really be looking carefully at what your resources are. And there are multiple different models. So a couple of things that, and I'm, I'm using some fairly well-known examples, but um, there are some, and I, what I put on this slide was a, a, a kind of approach between something that goes local, starts local and then expands locally, to something that goes global faster. And so let's start local. So Y Plan, I, I don't know if people are familiar with it, but it's a, a company based in Great Britain, based in London specifically, that helps you understand what's going on around London. It's an inherently local business. It's not a business that you're going to scale across Europe because you're just not. The, the local market is what this whole app is about. And so you have to think carefully about where are you going to go from point A to point B? And what does that look like? What do the resources look like? What does the expertise look like in order to do that? And if you go a little bit bigger, um, Uber is actually, again, a very, very local business at the end of the day. But they've been able to raise massive amounts of capital so they can open 200 local businesses at about the same time because they just have that kind of resource. So, but it's very important to understand when you think about your growth path, what is it? Um, Rocket Internet, I think everybody's pretty, uh, pretty familiar with. Those guys seem to kind of bridge local versus global because of the way they have their footprint and the amount of capital that they have, but we could talk for a long time about them and we won't. So, um, but when you, then when you start thinking about global platforms, some of these are often tech, tech platforms, and, and the reason I put Facebook and Nutanix, and I'll t explain Nutanix in a little bit, um, is because these platforms are capable of going global really quickly. They don't have any problem necessarily in being able to expand to different geographies. There may be some language considerations, there may be some other considerations, but they're fairly minor. And I'm an early investor in a company called Hootsuite, which is another space like this, and I have a great story for this. So Hootsuite is really popular in a lot of places around the world, and it's a social media management dashboard that helps you to manage your Twitter, to manage your Facebook, and uh, you know, those, all of your different social media. So a couple years ago, they were thinking about going to Japan because, not because they had a plan to go there, because the Japanese people had actually literally translated Hootsuite into Japanese because they liked the product so much. So they did it themselves. So the, literally the customers trans did all of the work for the company in order to get them to do more stuff in Japan. So, there's examples of things that you can do that are thinking outside the box a little bit in order to, to make these kinds of transitions happen. Now, Nutanix I put up here because it is a, it's an enterprise software, and they do scaled storage in the, in the cloud. Um, they're growing very quickly. You'll see them IPO later this year in the US if you pay attention. Um, they are they're an enterprise sales platform. The product is actually one that's very global but it has to scale based on the sales team. So it, it looks, it has a little bit of a local stepwise approach to, to scaling, even though technically the product is very much a global product. So again, you need to look a little bit at the type of product you have, plus the customers and the, the approach to selling that, that is in your, in your particular space. 
So not just, I don't want to just lecture, so I'm going to give you actually a couple of stories. I think stories are, are a better way to tell, tell things anyway. So this is actually my second startup. So my first one actually did pretty well. That's less interesting. Let's talk about this one. So company number one that I'm talking about today is a company called Broadband Digital Group. So what we were was back in 2000, um, and this probably gives you a little bit of a hint about the story anyway, uh, we were one of the first broadband internet service providers in the United States. And at the time, that was a huge deal because everybody was not going to just have dial-up anymore. They were going to get broadband. They were going to see video. They were going to do all this kind of cool stuff. So this was pretty much us for about the first six months. I literally, we had a specific schedule. We started at 8. We went to the gym at 2. We came back. We had dinner at 8. We left, we left the office at 2 came back before eight, so about you know, six hours of sleep, unless we were sleeping under our desks. Um, month six, huge deal. We thought that this was the coolest thing ever, and I'm not sure, but I think we were actually one of the first freemium type of products at the time. So we launched free broadband, which was crazy at the time because it's really, really expensive. Um, they, if you went to some of the other providers, they were probably charging something like $100, $200 a month for, for this. Some cases less, but it was really, really expensive. So we launched it free. And the number of registered users in the first week, drum roll please, 1,500,000, one, one week. And at the time, the public markets, which in the United States as we know now are very overvalued, were valuing per user, $2,000. So we went from having a company that was not live to telling everybody we were worth $3 billion in one week. So definition of a bubble. Um, now operationally, what that looked like was this. Our investors said, okay, if you're gonna be a big player, you need to put a national network in place in the, in the US, right? This is how you're gonna scale. This is how you play big. So we built out a network in three months that hit 48 cities in the US. Um, that included all the lines, all the routers, all the hardware, all, all everything in order to try to launch these people. And a very costly enterprise in order to do that. Um, and then, again, kept working with our investors to say, okay, what we should do. At this point, we had already raised $25 million. So we were nine months in, we had raised $25 million. Tells you a little bit about how much money we had for scaling. Month 15, this is actually a little bit over, I didn't have an actual picture, but this is kind of the idea of, okay, we went crazy. Went to 150 cities in order to see, okay, we, we really are gonna scale this thing now. We're gonna be the biggest thing ever in the, in the US. Um, and we were on the verge at this point of raising another $50 million. So, month 18, we actually were, we had a decision, so we were gonna raise, we could raise $50 million at a $200 million valuation, which you know, our CEO at the time thought, wow, that's really low. I mean, we $2,000 a user, we should be at about $3 billion. Seems crazy. Or we could sell it for $250 million. Somebody had offered us cash offer, $250 million. So I was there. I owned 10% of this thing, so felt pretty good about myself at the time, you know? feels not so bad, so we had the discussions over and over and over. Okay, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Are we going big? Are we going to get, we going to be able to get this? And the outcome, we decided not to sell. So I went from being worth $25 million on paper to being broke because the $50 million didn't come through. And as soon as that didn't come through, John got to lay off 350 people in one day which was one of the worst experiences I think of my entire life. And uh, as an investor now, I pay very, very close attention to whether or not people have enough capital and whether their plans actually match with what they're trying to do. So that's, uh, that's one scenario. That's, that's how you don't grow, but I'll... Now let me jump to number two. So Credit Tech, I had told you about earlier, I am an early investor there, so I've known these guys since they were kind of three guys in a coffee shop. They've now grown to about a 50 million revenue run rate. So this one, I'll give you a little hint. Um, 
what they do is they do big data scoring and, and underwriting for uh, emerging markets. So in 2012, Series A, I put in an, a couple of million dollars into this company, and they were only operating in Poland. So they had done about $10,000 in loans, not very much, had not scaled at all, but the, the numbers were early and, and interesting. In 2013, we started to expand. So we raised a little bit of capital. We actually raised another $5 million in 2013, plus $10 million in debt. So we went from Poland to Spain, started executing there, and then at the same time, we launched in the Czech Republic and Russia, and then we went to Mexico. So each one was done at a specific kind of plan and approach, and one at a time, in a time that we thought that we could do this. And we had a template. So we built this specific growth template. And what we said was, first, let's figure out, is, they, is there a regulatory framework that we can work within in this country? And that was a big deal. Then we did a quick analysis of competition to see if there wasn't competition, we knew we wouldn't be able to actually execute. So we actually looked specifically to make sure that there would be competition there. Then we figured out what it was going to cost to license and set up in each market. And if we could do that, then we were okay to go. So once we did that, we would kind of basically, we would see the market. It took us about three to four months to see the market and see how it would work and then we could launch. It was a really low cost approach to doing gro growth globally. We could do this whole thing in three months in about $50,000, something like that. So these are a couple of numbers. So in 2014, we went from a 10, by the end of 2013, we were at a 10 million revenue run rate, went to 40 million in, at the end of 2014. And you can see the numbers have just really kind of exploded. But they've done so in a stepwise fashion that was actually really well planned out and had a nice template. And in 2014, we went to Poland, Spain, Czech Republic, Russia, Mexico, Australia, Peru, Dominican Republic, and Kazakhstan. So you can see also it's very, very much a, a diverse set of, of markets. And they were chosen based on those templates that I mentioned earlier. So in 2015, this is the growth now raised 220 million so far, and there's another 100 million coming. And it's grown from 220 people to 500 people. But you can see that the capital has coincided along with the actual growth of the company. The company metrics are very healthy to support this kind of capital, and the growth plan has been in place along the way. And this launching in Romania. So you'll see, you'll see Credit Tech in the not too distant future here. So what can we learn from this? So one, grow within your means. If I, if I fund a company and I see somebody driving one of these, unless they drove up to my office in this in the first place, I know that we've got a problem. Um, are there regulations and barriers that you have to pay attention to? Um, look for these. They can be positive, they can be negative, but you have to understand what those regulatory hurdles might be or what those barriers are as you're looking at different markets and market opportunities. Know your customers. So just because something works in Romania doesn't mean it's going to work in Germany. You guys know this better than us. Americans tend to think of the world in kind of chunks. They think of it as America, you know, South America, Europe, Asia, and maybe we separate out China. But we're pretty stupid when it comes to actually understanding nuances between markets. But it's really, really important to understand what are the patterns of your customers? What are the, what are the things that they do? Does this translate to another market? Because you can waste a ton of money going into a market that's not actually a good fit for your product. And do you have the ability to serve them? So if you're not very, if you're not very well equipped to be able to go really global like this, then don't be going global like this. You know, Credit Tech, for example, is able to do loans in Mexico with nobody on the ground. So they can do it all with technology. So they are not constrained geographically whatsoever in terms of their ability to go to different markets. If you're in e-commerce, I'm sorry, but it looks dramatically different. And if you're doing enterprise sales of hardware, same kind of thing. You need to really pay attention to what are your cap capabilities when you're thinking about these types of, of moves. And don't buy swampland in a land grab. <laughs> so. I told you a little bit about what we did at Broadband Digital. Now I'm putting the dots on. 80% of our customers were in five cities. 
So our investors told us we should be in 150 cities because we had to have a big footprint. Guess what? We could have launched 1.2 million people if we had just been in five cities. And so when I look back at that, it was we should have been thinking much more strategically about how did we approach our launch to market and our spending, not just thinking we're going to go big. So start with small tests and, and collect the data. Understand what you need to do before you, before you make any big moves. Build the blueprint that you need to have in order to, to scale to different places. And go big, because I tell everybody all the time, if you're going to start a company, there's just as much risk in going small as there is in going big. Because if you're doing it smart, you're gonna, you have just as much opportunity but you're, you are taking the same risk starting a company, whether you're trying to start a small company or whether you're trying to start a big company. So I always tell everybody, have the aspirations to go as big as you possibly can, but do it in a really smart way. Thank you. I think now I'm, I think I'm, I'm yeah, literally the only thing standing between anybody and the bar, so. Um. That's, that's fair enough. Um, it seems that, that people like, can have drinks every night, but they'll not have a chance to <laughs> ask you questions all the time. Okay. So thanks very much yes. also for this Thank honest you. talk. So right. I appreciated that. And I can very sympathize to the failures. <laughs> so my first company also burned through all the money, and we made a lot of mistakes. Yes, so, it does happen, doesn't um, it? It's good, it's good if investors pay that failure. It is. If you don't need to pay out of your own pockets. So yes. we should commend all of our investors who, who paid for our sins, as we Definitely said in the earlier true. talk. I, I'm grateful for my investors doing that as well. <laughs> I've learned quite a bit. OK. So then we'll see who has, uh, who has uh, questions here, um, and who is willing to be brave enough to keep everybody else from drinks. <laughs> Did you have a question? You just raised your hand or were just like stretching? OK. Please, Steffi. Do we have somebody with a microphone? Yes, there. Hi. Thank you for your pre presentation, John. I have a question. Since we are here in Romania, and you are such an experienced investor, how do you see Romania? How do you see the startup world here in Romania? I really want to know this. Yes, I, I think, I, first of all, let me put it this way. I wouldn't be here if I didn't see promise, because I do invest all over the world. I travel a lot. But if I didn't think that there was real opportunity and real, you know, real talent, I would not probably be spending time here. So I believe, you know, We've, there's been a couple of conversations earlier about ecosystems, and I pay a lot of attention to ecosystems. Many of the ingredients that are needed are here already in Romania to build a great ecosystem, and arguably one of the better ones with the tech, with the tech talent. Um, I do think we need more capital that comes in, and it may need to be more local capital to start, because I think for, for venture capitalists like me, I tend to look at opportunities and opportunity costs between markets. So we're going to need to see some scaling of some businesses. But I think that you know, if we get the people with the right aspirations and with the, you know, the opportunities are huge. The markets around here are very big, and that they're, they're plenty big to support really great companies. And what is your pattern to find out? How if, are you scanning these opportunities? Uh, well, I'm here now you know, a lot to learn. So to me, the first thing I need to do is learn. Because I can't make a good investment until I understand a lot about the people, the market, um, and those types of things. So um, I don't have a specific agenda of scanning as much as I do to, to just absorb as much as I can and learn as much as I can from the people here. Thank you. Thank you. If, if, if there's nobody other ask, having questions, oh, now we have a question. <laughs> oh, there are more questions. But I also want to ask here, taking the opportunity, who here wants to have money from John for his startup? <laughs> Ah, finally we have some people alive in the audience. OK, so we'll take the two questions here, and then we'll give you a chance to 30 seconds pitch why John should give you money. <laughs> Perfect. Hello, Colleen Hello. here. Uh, maybe I didn't get, but what was the revenue model for 3DSL? So there were large valuations there, but how would they? So uh, free, 3DSL was literally a freemium product. So what we did is we built technology that enabled us to scale the speed of your connection. 
So when you, we had it all set, so even though we were in 48 cities, we had routers that would smartly connect you. So if you went free, you were twice as fast as dial up. If you wanted to get normal speeds, you would pay 50 to $100. And so we were segmenting our customer base based on their, their willingness to pay. And our average cost was about $30 a user per month in order to support that. But that didn't include the network that was kind of outside the users. So on a unit cost, we were way underwater. On the gross margin, though, we were making about $39 a user because most would actually opt for a price point that was above what our cost was. Thank you. Uh, my name is Isabella. Uh, my question was, uh, you mentioned a, b a bit earlier that you're interested mainly in f financial tech. Are you looking at some other areas as well? And then, um, how can somebody get in contact with you? <laughs> and uh, what stage should their startup be at to be able to come and talk to a VC yeah. or to... So I do, look at, I do look at investments outside of FinTech. I've, about half of my investments have been in FinTech. So if people ask me for a specific industry, that's the one that I go to. But um, my most important un area is, like I said earlier on my first panel, the team. So if I can find a great team going after a big opportunity. So the other thing I need to be able to validate, and part of the reason I spend time in different markets, is to understand markets. Because it's, it's very important for me to figure out if, if someone is going after a big opportunity or a small opportunity. And I care less about the industry than I care about the overall size of the, of the opportunity and the team going after it. Um, as far as how to get in touch with me, I don't think I put my email at the end, but it's john, J-O-N, at expansive.vc. Just send me an email. I'm actually better on email than any other medium, so that's the best way to get in contact with me. And then I will say in terms of getting investments, and you know, there was a presentation here where somebody was turned down 100 times by 100 VCs. That happens because the odds are actually really low, at least on the venture capital side of getting an investment. This year, we're on track to see something like 10,000 companies, and we're going to invest in 10. So I get to say no 999 times for every time I say yes. It's not the most fun part of my job, but it is part of my job. So um, I don't want to discourage people. What I actually want you to do is to, to understand from our side of the table that if somebody says no, that's not necessarily an indication that your business is not good. It's an indication that they might have something that they think looks a little bit better, do you, probably in a totally different industry. Do you tell the people what you think they should be do, doing better? Do you say just no or ignore them, or do you like send them what you think I, they should be doing if better? If I find something that I think is actually an issue that they should be focused on, I give them that feedback. Um, a lot of times, though, it's not so much that that I think that there's a problem with what somebody's doing. It's that you know somebody else is growing like credit tech, and it's hard to compete with that. And so that's kind of where I think entrepreneurs can often very be focused on their market, and they should be. An investor is actually literally trying to compare apples and oranges and pick which kind of fruit they like on a daily basis. And so that's not something that you would necessarily see if you're if you haven't see, seen my side of the table. True. Do we have other questions for, for, for John? Or is anybody really brave enough to pitch to him on stage? So now is your, your chance to get direct feedback. I, and he can't I, just, I'm happy to do this. He, he yeah. can't just ignore you because he has to give you some feedback. <laughs> so he, like, if you send him an email, there's a chance he'll never reply. But we could give like one lucky uh, startup the chance to do a, a live one minute pitch. Hi. Hi. My name is Paul. Hi, Paul. Come I'd on like stage. to get up if it's yes. okay. Yeah, yeah, come on stage and... Nice meeting nice you, to meet John. You. I have a question. We met earlier today, actually. Yes, yes, yes. that's <laughs> fine. But pitch to him, not to me. Yes. He has uh, the money. Th th <laughs> Did you have a coffee? Um, no, I didn't, actually. Well, you should see us in the entrance hall. Okay. And I kindly invite you to a coffee. Okay. And then the next question I have, did you get my email? Don't think I, I'm behind on my emails because I've been traveling. So I accept the expo, <laughs> but the invitation is to come over uh -huh. and hope to impress you on a very nice cup of coffee, okay. a personalized one that will be the drink that is personalized the way just you like it. Hmm. Okay. And the machine is actually an innovation because you know when Steve Jobs was introducing something called a mobile i smartphone. Yes. At that time there was the Nokia, and Nokia was doing what? Texting and talking. Then he came and he had a story about the connectivity of things, the internet of things, and everything along. And then he says, yeah, and by the way, you can also text and call. We have a coffee machine 
black and white. You can text and call on it. And we can <laughs> connect everything. And you can personalize it any place, anytime, anywhere, the drink just the way you like it. And of course, it also makes the black and white, you know, mm. coffee black okay. and white. But it can also be personalized like in the Starbucks flavoring drinks the way you like it. Okay. So please be my guest to come and join for All the right. coffee. I will do that. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. No, 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 you're not get off stage now. <laughs> so I'll not get uh, without, but that was, congratulations for the, for the bravery. So I appreciate that very much. Thank and you. you're like chasing John, like you're like starting to wring the money out of him. <laughs> so I like that very much. That's the kind of person you need to, yes. to, to get to an investor. So John, what so, do you think about the coffee so maker? I, I have a couple of rules with my investments, so let me start there. One is I'm never the customer. So I know. Um, not sure if that, uh, <laughs> that so I would, I would love to try it, but I would always tell you that my taste in coffee is probably totally different from the rest of the world, and so therefore what I think is not relevant to my decision. Um, and I can even accept that. But what I would ask you is what, what, is, what are the customer feedback so far? Well. This is what we were also very nicely impressed with, because this is our reads, test the market, let's say, if you mm -hmm. like, but we've done many searches and uh, investigations, but we found that people go with comments today like, wow, coolness, mm -hmm. 100, sexy product, this is the next thing. Connectivity, personalize it the way you like it, people love it. Okay, cool. We so, have first customers launching, uh -huh. 650 machines sold this year. Okay. So we are rolling now, but we need some venture capital in order to scale up the way you talk. Uh huh. So 650, 650. 1.4 million euro turned 1. over. 1.4 million euro this mm -hmm. year. That's good. I, uh, and so we have what, a hell of a team. How much, how much money do you need and how, how, where are you At this next? stage where we are, because I understand, of course, uh, but we need like half a million, we estimate right now. Mm -hmm. To and get to what we start the product to produce and to roll out the product. Uh huh. And so the 500K will get you where? Uh, that would get us uh, to do the planning that we have very conservatively done in our business because we also get bank financing in the combination, but it's the risk factor that the banks consider too much, so uh -huh. we need to reduce it a bit. Okay. And then we said we go out now for venture capital, and this is a moment maybe we can find money on the stage. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I carry, I carry cash in a suitcase back in my, my hotel room. Um, okay, so, so John, do you yes, promise to look at the coffee tomorrow? I promise to look at the coffee. Fantastic. Yes. Good. So thank you very much again. Thanks again, right. John. Thank you. And try to read my mail. All right. Cheers. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you very much.